All right, welcome back. What did everybody think of the hand witch? Let's give it a hand for the hand witch. And, um, just one hand. One hand. Just give one hand for the hand witch. <laughs> so we have a, a video interview. Uh, many of you may know that uh, back in May, uh, myself, Brian, and Howe, uh, took a journey out to the West Coast uh, after communicating with Rolly Crump and his wife. And uh, they were gracious enough to invite us into their home. When we sat there in Rolly's living room and reminded him that we, had sent, we were doing this event and we had sent him a letter introduce, uh, inviting him to come and be our, our, our keynote speaker, he laughed and he said, <laughs> nice try. Because <laughs> he doesn't travel anymore. Yeah. So graciously invite us into their home and uh, we sat there for two and a half hours or so and asked him a whole host of questions and we had a little yeah, soft yeah okay. so we it's, it's like it's like it's, in. it's like Susan. watching first graders get on the bus for the first time <laughs> having to squeeze Susan three our, to a seat usual setup here this is so we asked him a whole host of questions and we we grabbed over two hours of video and audio footage and it was amazing and um uh, after we say goodbye, uh, Maurice, his wife, set out a fantastic spread of food. We sat down on his lanai porch area. They, and they were wraps, so it was a one-handed sandwich. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's it's all on brand here. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to go through here, obviously we can't play all two hours, but what we selected is a number of different stories that we think you will find interesting. Uh, there's some new things in here we had never heard before historically where certain things came from that he walked uh, that he worked on so how has a, a whole selection of cards here you're not going to mix them brand no, we're we're not we have a, we have an order to our right. AV crew so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce uh, the topics uh, talk a little bit about them and then let Roly speak for himself yeah so so, so first up uh, one of my favorite attractions and possibly one of yours here at Walt Disney World was Mr. Toad's Wild Ride um, yeah um, it was an opening day attraction Beloved by the fans, as I could just tell from the reaction. Um, it had a very unique two-track system, uh, which Rolly will speak about. Uh, and, and one thing that we found out was originally Rolly was in charge of all the Fantasyland rides. So uh, when uh, Dirk, Dick Irvine came to him and said, like, hey, we want you to be in charge of Fantasyland Dark Rides. So uh, he worked on that personally. And uh, we're going to roll the video now where he talks about how he got involved. Oh, yeah. Well, that was my favorite ride when I, that was so Dick Nunes' idea. Did you a little story about Dick and I? Yes, and that <laughs> Dick said, when we were getting ready to do dark rides for Florida, Dick came to me and he said, are you going to do a toad ride? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you're going to have to do uh, two toad rides, he said, because <clears throat> that's the most popular dark ride in Disneyland. And so I said, well, I can't do just do two identical ones. So that's when I merged the two of them together. So the cars would come in, you'd go, one car would go to the right, the other car would go to the left, and then they would meet in town square, and then they would go this way and that way. And I thought it was kind of fun because I thought if families went on the ride, and somebody said, do you remember the chickens in the chicken coop? No, I don't remember any chickens in the chicken coop. <laughs> because the family would see different scenes from the different parts of the ride. And I thought that was kind of fun. So I enjoyed doing that, and I was really, I don't know why they took it out. I mean, they needed space for something, so why not pick on the toad ride? Because it's the right size that they wanted, or the right square footage or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> when I did that ride, I want to make sure that the characters look like the characters from animation. So I got an animator. To, I hired him to come in and do all the characters, because I knew that I couldn't do a job as good as the animator that actually did those. So I always called upon people that <clears throat> did, would do better. Okay. And that was the thing that Walt once said. He said he always wants to hire somebody that was better than he was. So I thought, yeah, that's right. So I'd always, if there was something that had to be, I didn't try to trace them. No, I brought them in. So that was great. Well, I actually designed the ride and built a model on it. So, you know, everything that we did was because Walt always wanted to see models because he wanted to see the three dimensions. So I actually designed a whole ride, you know, and did a, 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 a model on it. And I, everything I ever did was a model. And then they showed it to Walt, and Walt loved that. That was, a, that was kind of a given. You know, you didn't, you didn't show Walt sketches all the time because, you know, he, he, he wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> Jim, do you, uh, do you want to open the deck? 
I always thought I was driving on Toad. I don't know why. As a kid, I thought I was actually controlling the ride. It, it was crushed when I realized I wasn't driving the car. House of Magic, you take Oh, okay. Um, another thing that he worked on that, that we did not realize was uh, he actually did the interior design for the House of Magic magic shop that was on Main Street, USA. So that was a, a huge surprise to us. That was a, an opening day store on Main Street. In 1995, uh, they actually gutted it and it became the Hall of Champions store as there was like that big Main Street redo and they redid the Emporium. Uh, and then in 2007, for reasons that I don't know if any, somebody in this room might know it, but it's not us, the facade mysteriously reappeared on Main Street and it says House of Magic again, although there's not magic stuff in there. So I don't know if that's... You don't think merchandise is magic? <laughs> <laughs> the money is magic. The magic is in the money, yeah. Um, uh, so when we spoke to him, we were, we were surprised to discover his work uh, on that, and, and he actually told us a little bit about that. Because it was my hobby. Oh. And uh, I know that I, I started a, a hobby of magic when I was eight or nine years old. And so magic carried through with me, and, and I used magicians on some of the designs I did for the Berry Tales to actually design illusions in there. And uh, I never had a chance to do that for Disney, but on the outside, I could bring in people and to do that. But I always loved the magic, and so when uh, there was a magic shop in um, Hollywood, and uh, I loved the way it was set up, and as a way, because I had to go over there on Saturdays and look at all the tricks I wanted to buy. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to duplicate that magic shop in Disney World. And so that was the direction I took. Nice. And you know, the interesting thing about it was I did a detailed model on the magic shop. And I actually hand painted it myself, all the squares and the floor and everything. And so when it came time for the people to build it, they said, well, where are your drawings? And I gave them the model. <laughs> and they, they couldn't believe that, that I had actually designed it to scale in a model form. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> but that was just, you know, those are the things that you do as you learn. And it, it made things so much easier. And, every, and when you hand that model to somebody, say, oh, that's what you want. Yeah, it's so there. House of Magic. Uh, one of the other attractions we talked to him about that Rolly was part of was the, uh, the super group that put together the 1964 World's Fair attraction. It's a small world. Uh, which is so beloved it went into every castle park in the 20th century. Uh, the super group was, of course, Mark Davis and Rowley and Claude Coates and Alice Davis and Blaine Gibson and probably a dozen other people that had a hand in things that were part of it. Uh, Rowley's most famous for the Tower of the Four Winds that stood outside uh, the entrance at the World's Fair Pavilion, or at the Small World Pavilion, which was sponsored by Pepsi at the 64 World's Fair in Flushing Meadows. Uh, but Early in the conversation, this was very early in the interview, he tells us about this term that will now re-enter the Diz lexicon, I guess, uh, because I hadn't heard it talked about before. Uh, and we all were like, wow, that's a cool thing to find out 10 minutes into this interview. So here's, here's Rolly on It's a Small World. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was involved with Small World wherever it went. <laughs> I had to make sure it was all right. Neither, yeah, I, I think the biggest uh, problem I had was, especially Disney World, they didn't stage it properly. Mm -hmm. You know, Disneyland, my God, we had the 300 feet across the front or whatever. And when they, uh, when they did Disney World, <laughs> they, there was a little area called Irvine Alley. And that was Dick Irvine had made this little tiny place to walk. And oh, by the way, we'll put Small World there. And so we were forced to put Small World in a very tiny area, and, uh, which was quite disturbing. And because after you got used to the one at Disneyland, you know, the one at Disney World was kind of sad. But the good thing about Disney World was I got to put water to the sets. Yeah. And that did not happen at Disneyland, you know, because in those days we hadn't done anything in that area, in that direction. And Walt never thought of it, neither did I. But, uh, yeah, so that was one of the happy accidents That's that we did. There is a little story behind the balloons. I took Walt through there on a walkthrough once, and we were one little area, and it was in that particular area, and he says, well, he says, you know, you've got a space up there. He said, uh, he had a title for it. It's a, a film title, and I forget what it was. 
holiday. He says, you got a holiday up there? And I said, I do? And he says, yeah. And he said, I said, what the hell's a holiday? Because he knew, yeah, because it was all uh, film talk. What it meant was it was an empty space. So he explained to me what they thought. So at the space, I said, oh, hell, we can take care of that. I'll just put some balloons up there. <laughs> so I said, okay, and that's how the balloons got there. Oh, nice. That's a great one. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to remember all the different yeah. little things about Small World. I, all I knew was I was always in love with it, and I was in love with Mary, and I was so faithful to her, faithful as that could be, because you know, what happened was we were getting ready to do the, the uh, ride and Walt wanted to do a children's ride. And so he brought, we were in a meeting one time, just the three of us, and he said, I want <clears throat> a children's ride about around the world. And I told Dick Irvine that. So Dick Irvine said, okay. So Dick got, uh, <laughs> I said, I'll have Mark Davis do an uh, illustration of what the interior small world would look like. So he did a beautiful rendering. And he brought it in the next week, and he showed it to Walt. And took, Walt took one look at it. He says, what's Mary Blair doing? <laughs> <laughs> it, because Mark didn't have that little charm that Mary had. And so uh, Walt asked uh, Irvine to call Mary and find if she'd be interested. So they called her on the phone and asked her if she'd like to work on this little ride and everything. So she said yes. And um, what she did do was, uh, uh, a whole series of sketches of children around the world in her style, and that basically is what designed Small World, which is great. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So how we got that story about the balloons was Hal showed him a picture of the clown and the balloon holding the help sign that has since been taken out of the ride and said, what's the story behind this? And as happened frequently when we showed him pictures of stuff in both that and Mr. Toad, he said, I didn't do that. That must have been added after me. <laughs> yeah, so we actually have to take a, take a deep dive with him to see what part of Toad that, uh, that we're familiar with before it got changed was actually his and what may have come in through a rehab in the 80s. So uh, TBD, we'll be, we're, yeah, we are working on that now. Yeah. So we're going to move over to Epcot Center, uh, where Raleigh had a hand not only in the original uh, uh, pavilions, uh, but some stuff that went on later. But his most famous contribution to the original Epcot Center uh, is the Land Pavilion, uh, much of which has survived the way that he designed it. Uh, and they were working on a greenhouse concept tour. He was working with Carl Hodges, who was the head of environmental research at the University of Arizona. Boy, he waxes poetic about Carl Hodges. I don't know if that's in there or not, but uh, they're both very old men still alive. And in uh, 1992, Carl created the Biosphere 2 project to see if people could live in a self-contained ecosystem. So that's a little bit of background on Carl, who he refers to in this video here on the land. Carl Hodges is probably one of my most favorite people I ever worked with. I think that was the thing about, you know, when you were in charge of pavilions and stuff, you get the right people in the right team. And they, I, I, they, they had, somebody found Carl Hodges and said, well, there's this guy we want you to go see, really. <clears throat> he lives in Phoenix. And so I said, okay, fine. So I went to his office, and his whole office was a rainstorm going on. He had designed storm inside of a building, and it went 24 hours a day. And I said, Jesus Christ, Carl, so what's this all about? Well, he, was, he was, it had a lot to do with the saving water and using it correctly. So uh, he and I got together, and so he came up with the idea of being able to grow uh, of, of plants in, in, the, uh, in space. So we, in the land pavilion that we did, he was a key guy for the land pavilion. So we had all these vegetables growing on, and then the, on a little tractor, and then it would go through a car wash, and that's how they would be fed. So they were fed by car washers. So those goddamn things would run 24 hours a day. And of course, it was underneath a, a sunlit roof. So they got sunshine during the day, and they got their, their little alcohol, I mean, their drinks during the night. And Hanches had a fit because they were, we were growing things in, in a building and trees. And he had also trees uh, that were growing in one, uh, one foot of sand because of uh, the ingredients that he put in there. And Hanch had a fit because he thought we'd have to use fake plants because they were in a building. I said, no, John. I said, he, know why, he knows what he's doing. So he and I became real close friends. 
And he, what he did was one time he took the roof off his house in Phoenix. He and his wife had, you went into the house, you walked through the door, and there was no roof. And I said, what are you doing? It rains. He said, well, we get in the jacuzzi. And I said, you do? And that was another thing that happened was he and his wife said, well, we got to go into the jacuzzi now. And, and this was after dinner. And I said, we do? And I said, yeah. I said, I didn't bring your, my trunks. And they said, you're not wearing anything, Roland. So the three of us got into this jacuzzi naked. And I'm sitting there like, oh, I'm sure glad he brought his wife along. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things. But Carl was like that. He had the great, and, the, and, the, and the, he had the cool towers, which was a tower right through the center of his building, and the air would come out the bottom of it about 20 degrees cooler than what was on the outside because that had to do with the way he laid out the, the roof. So Carl was a delight to work with, and he, he, and he really helped us because that helped the ride immensely to be able to go through there and see there and see radishes going by in space. So he was, he was the key to the land pavilion as far as I was concerned. For some reason, we decided to do balloons. You know, all this stuff kind of happened by accident. But, um, you know, because, you know, it was the only way that we were going to fill that, that space, that, you know, the holiday. So I looked at that and I thought, yeah, it's a holiday. That's a big open space. So we'll, so we'll put the balloons in there. And then the balloons, in turn, will, the, the uh, illustrations on the balloons will relate to the pavilion. And so we did that, and it filled the space beautifully. They were attractive, and I had a little Chinese girl design the, the patterns on it, and it was just beautiful. So we were real happy with the balloons. And I know that years later, I think they took them down and repainted them a little bit, but I don't know what it was and they, they did. And they don't go up and down anymore. Yeah, that's right, they used to go up and down, right? Yeah. Well, as you can tell, Rolly didn't hold back with us. <laughs> we had a couple other clips we had to edit out. Um, before I mention the topic of, of this next, next one here, I, I think you guys are going to be able to get it with a couple clues. So this was made as a holding area for an original Epcot film uh, that later held an environmental fable. It's still there today. Uh, it was created by Rolly as well as a graphic and ex exhibit designer, Dolores Shelbourne. Uh, so we, what, what did we ask Rolly about? Everybody? Wall, wall carpet. We got it. So here's Rolly on wall carpet. It's wall carpet. <laughs> Uh, she was an incredible stylist, and uh, in the Land Pavilion, she, she, there was a waiting room before he went into the, to see the film. And so I told her to, to do an a abstract mural, but do it in carpet. And so we carpeted the walls and the ceiling in that holding area. You know what gave me the idea for the carpet? Was I was back east on one of our trips, and uh, I went to a restaurant. I forget where it was. And all the walls and ceilings had been carpeted. And in there, it was as quiet as a tomb. And you're in a restaurant, and normally restaurants are a nightmare. So I thought to myself, someday, I'm going to carpet the walls and the ceiling. And so we got a chance to do that, and, and Doris did it for me, which was great. There you go. And today, she is a senior executive for uh, Shanghai Disney. So she's had an incredible career from graphic designer to like this incredibly power, powerful executive. So From carpet to park. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We also are staying in Epcot here. Um, we asked Rolly about another area that uh, he had something to do with during uh, some uh, rehabilitation of the Epcot area. Uh, they brought him back in 1992 to work on innovations. Uh, we also found out that uh, the splash pad that is still there today and hopefully will survive, we don't know, that was actually his design. We had this, there was this book on this coffee table and it said Epcot Fountain and I nearly died. I'm like, is this the prison fountain, right? You know, I had no idea. And I opened it up and I was excited and disappointed at the same time. I'm like, well, at least we know where the splash pad came from. <laughs> yeah, so. so the splash pad's on that bridge between uh, Future World and World Showcase and he says, yeah, funny story about that. He said, uh, Imagineering had some guy in there, wanted to charge them some ridiculous amount of money. And I said to Michael Eisner, I can do that for about 20% of that. And he said, oh, really? He says, yeah. He says, you got the job. And that's how the fountains got there from Rolly Crump. Exactly. So we did ask him about another area uh, where it is still there today, uh, the electric umbrella. We, had, we were redoing uh, a restaurant at, at, at Epcot, and they didn't know what to do. 
And it just so happened that afternoon, uh, when we were going to do it, we would get started with it, uh, they brought an umbrella salesman in because they were getting some new umbrellas for out, outside, out front of it and everything. And so he was in there and he says, oh, the way he says, I've got an electric umbrella. I says, you do? Uh, I see. He says, yeah. And he actually, had, they, this company had built electric umbrellas with lights. And you could buy them. You didn't have to add them. They were there. So I thought, shit, that's great. So I said, okay, fine. And so I said, we're going to put those electric umbrellas in the restaurant. And then at nighttime, take the lights down in the restaurant. I mean, in, I mean, put the lights back up in the restaurant during the day and then turn on the electric umbrellas. Everybody got a big kick out of that. They just thought that was great. So I said, well, we'll call it the electric umbrella. <laughs> so that was it. Those are happy accidents again. He actually told us that Michael Eisner loved the idea so much, he actually wanted to call Innoventions Electric Umbrella, the entire thing. And they had to talk him down from doing that and go with Innoventions. He's an excitable guy. Yeah. <laughs> Still staying in Epcot here, he did a lot of work there. Uh, before we had Wonders of Life, there was a Wonders of Health Pavilion. This is early in the drawing board uh, stages of Epcot. Um, and uh, so we asked him a little bit about that because he was the lead designer and he told us a little bit about the attractions that were going to be in there. When they decided to do Epcot, they started bringing in educated people. And uh, Charles Lewis, uh, out of uh, UCLA, uh, Dr. Charles Lewis, had a, we had a um, uh, convention at Disney World on, on life health. And so they brought in all the health educators from everywhere to be in that convention, and we'd sit and listen to them. They'd get up and they'd do a talk about what their belief was about health. And Dr. Lewis said the greatest thing, and it's the greatest line I'll ever remember, he said, if it's a ton of fun and an ounce of information, you reach the teachable moment. And I thought, holy shit, he knows what he's talking about. And you know, that was why Disney really fit in, because we knew how to reach the teachable moment with no problem at all. So I had nothing but respect for him. And I know I worked closely with him on the land pavilion <clears throat> for quite a few months, and we weren't getting anywhere. And uh, I thought, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We're, so because that the the health people were still fighting with each other, and we were trying to listen to what they were saying and everything. So finally, I I went to him one day, and I said, wasn't there a common denominator as far as in the uh, life health world? that everyone will agree on, because they were fighting all the time. And he said, oh yeah, there's the eight health habits. And I said, what are the eight health habits? And he told me that, Jesus Christ, why didn't you tell me this months ago? <laughs> and so that changed the whole direction of doing the, la of the Life Health Pavilion, was the eight health habits. They took over. And I did a, a design, the, the, the carousel, with all the different little toys represented a health habit. We had little private uh, film shows about each habit. One was about the theater of the mouth, you know, and took it from there. And um, so we just, we had a great time. And then I had the best team in the world. Scott and Steve were absolutely incredible. So I just turned them loose on that and away we went. And so I felt really sad that we never got the financing to do the original Life Health. We, I met with Pfizer. I met the president of Pfizer. I, you know, this is when we had all the models and uh, sketches at, at the World's Fair, I mean, at uh, New York, and they rented space there. And so for us to try to sell this to all the big companies, we had these, these rooms all set up. And I know it was really funny. They, they'd stick me on an airplane that on Sunday night. I'd fly to New York. I'd spend the night in, in um, of all places, <laughs> one of the best ho of hotels in the world. And uh, mass, no, no, uh, anyway, anyway, and the next morning I'd get up and I'd give the presentation. And I gave it to the president of Pfizer one time, and he fell madly in love with it. And he says, you know, Rolly, he says, the only problem is we can't, our money is all in Europe, and we can't get the money out of Europe. And so, because, you know, Disney wanted that, the to share the finances of the pavilion, I think it was 50000 each, and so it would come to a total of 100000 and he was the sweetest man, God, and he loved everything that we were doing, but he didn't have the money. So they kind of put it back on the shelf. And it, it would have been great because we had a ride through the human body that was going to be done by uh, Frank Armitage. Frank Armitage was a wonderful illustrator, and he loved illustrating the, the human body. 
And so I had him come in and join us to do that. So we had a real, a real powerful team. <clears throat> and then the way it went. Yeah. yeah, it was really sad because we actually had a, it was a thrill ride. It was a regular thrill ride. You went through and then at one point you get up here and then there would be a, 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 a thunderstorm. And you'd go into the thunderstorm and down you'd go. So it was, it could have been absolutely great, but uh, no, it, things happen. Well, that wasn't the end of really working on uh, a health pavilion because a number of years later, you got a call from an old friend. Do you remember who it was? Oh, uh, well, I think he'll say who it is. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I made these videos months ago. So, <laughs> uh, to help out with the new Wonders of Life pavilion. Um, that was Marty Scalar. He, uh, he called me and said, you know, really, I, we want to put a, 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 a mobile in Wonders of Life. He said, because it's just a big empty space up there. So I said, okay. So I actually uh, did it on a scratch pad and gave it to him. And Marty says, okay, fine. So he went to somebody to build it. And he gave it to him and said, build this. And the guy says, what's that? And he says, well, it's, an, you know, it's a mobile. And they said, what's a mobile? And so the guy, and he said, well, do I get a working drawing? And she said, no, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, they, all these guys that do stuff figure they have to have a drawing or a working drawing. And they said, no, no. He says, you build that mobile right off that sketch. And I said, I feel good about that. <laughs> My son hung that mobile. Yeah, because he, he was working with me at the time. He says, I don't trust anybody else, so I'll do it. So they sent him up on a lift, and he hung it. Because he's been part of working with all of this, you know, as time goes on. In fact, the interesting story about it was <clears throat> when we were finishing the Tower of the Four Winds uh, downtown L.A. where they were building it, I took my family down there on a weekend to see what, what I was doing and everything. And so I've got pictures of my son standing there with all the pieces from the Tower of the Four Winds. And he's never forgotten that. Well, when I had my show, he built me a scale model of the, of the Tower of the Four Winds that actually worked for my show. So I thought that was incredible. His son is uh, Chris Crump, who uh, worked on Tokyo Disney Sea and a lot of other things, too. So I believe he is still active with Imagineering. It's uh, really cute. Yeah. As we wound down our interview with uh, Roly, one of the things that we did was ask him about his associations with certain people over the years, as we did earlier with, with Tom and Bob up here. Uh, and of course, we asked about Dick Nunes. So we have our Dick Nunes uh, story favorites. from Roly. This is my favorite, I Rowley. love this. Oh yeah. Only thing he, we and I worked close together because I worked at Disneyland as supervising art director for like three or four years. And, and worked real closely with Dick and did everything. And he, one day he was showing me how he ran the park. He took a box of popcorn and dumped it. He says, that'll be gone in five minutes. My guys will clean it up and I don't have to ask him. And sure enough, within five minutes, somebody was going to go over there and swept it up because he wanted the park immaculate. And so he, was, he trained people to do that. <clears throat> when I went to Circus World, I ran into Dick once, you know, I told Dick, I said, you know, we're doing circus when I said it's going to give Disney some competition. I still love Disney. I wasn't putting Disney down. I was just telling him that what we're doing is a great theme park. Well, Nunes took it as I was putting Disney down, and I was saying Circus World was better. That wasn't the case. It was just the idea that I wanted him to know that I was using everything that I learned from him and everybody else. I'm doing that for Circus World. <clears throat> so every time I'd see him, and I, every time I'd see him now, how are you doing, Dick? He says, you know, you still think that you're better. You know? And I said, oh, come on, Dick, get all of that. I said, no, not at all. But he was so diff, uh, dis, uh, to work with in Florida that there was a big sign put up that once, uh, they were tired of Disney World, once Disney World opens up, the, the newness will wear off. <laughs> And so, you know, and I thought, Jesus Christ, that's great. I mean, what a way to get back at him. But I think what he did was brilliant. I love the way he ran the park, and I think it should have carried on even more so. But he was good. It couldn't be any better. I learned a lot from, from him, and, uh, 
and then the admiration that he had for Walt and fought for that. So that was good. No, I got nothing but give him a big 10. <laughs> well, we weren't disappointed in his Dick Nunes answer. <laughs> Uh, and he, he got us with one other one. We asked the same question we asked of Bob and Tom. Uh, we asked him about Roy Disney, because you hear a lot of stories about this one and Walt, and, and you don't hear so many about Roy. So now when we get an opportunity to, to ask people who, who knew him or might have worked with him, uh, we ask the question. And we got a great story on that one, too. The only time I dealt with Roy was when we finished uh, the new Tomorrowland and we were all having lunch up at the penthouse. And I'd never met Roy the whole time. I'd never even barely seen him. And Roy walked over to me, he says, are you Roly Crump? And he says, I just want you to know my brother used to talk about you. And I thought, I was <laughs> and he turned around and walked away. I thought, holy shit, <laughs> you know, what, what, you know you, what better credit can you have? And to have the brother say, my brother talked about you. <laughs> well, speaking of his brother, we did ask him about Walt as well. And uh, I, when I made this clip, I made sure to take different comments throughout the entire interview. Uh, Rolly was speaking about Walt in many different ways, and I tried to sum it up as best I could. In fact, when I had my exhibit in the library, my art in the library, um, I had mobiles, I had my uh, propellers and everything, but I had all my dope posters in a hallway. And, and, and then the, the librarian called and said, Walt was here here today and saw your exhibit. I said, oh my God, did he go down the hallway? And she says, yes. I said, did he see my posters? And she says, yes, he did. She says, in fact, he laughed. <laughs> and you know what? I'm sure he did. I, you know, he had a great sense of humor. I think he, what he saw and what I did was it was a tongue in cheek. It wasn't anything serious, whether it was a marijuana or whatever. I was just poking fun at things and he accepted me doing that. Didn't take it, didn't read it any other way. So it was, uh, was kind of neat. Yeah. Walt always had two uh, story men work together and he'd always make sure that they didn't get along because he knew that if these two guys didn't get along, the best product would come out. That was the old man, that's what he did. He was brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. And he would do it in kind of big smile on his face. <laughs> you know, he, he really uh, accepted everybody for who they were, and, and he also realized that he had a company that did nothing but tease people, play games with him. I mean, it was a playful place to work, and he knew that. So he never, never held anything against, against that at all. And some of the crazy stuff that took place there was unreal, so yeah. <laughs> yeah incredible man, Jesus. It was in the morning. I was at my office and John Hench came out and told me. And that's just when everything just went whew. I mean, when he passed away, you could feel it throughout the company. And I went, went out and had some drinks and I ended up crying and I damn near cried all night long uh, about that. That was a very emotional time frame because it was pretty much a secret. You know, they kept it real quiet about what he was, why he went to the hospital and everything. So it was, it was hard. It was hard on all of us. In fact, I remember um, when that day happened, we all went over to one of the restaurants that we all went to and we had cocktails and we drank to Walt. And then we kept on drinking and drinking and, you know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of sad. And then I ended up crying most of the night. It was, it was just tragic. I mean, it's hard to believe that Walt Disney's gonna die. No, not at all. That picture hangs in the foyer of his house. All right, we do have one other Rolly video for you. And uh, this is actually gonna be a little bit of audience participation. So I'm gonna let Hal, JT and I go off and take care of something. I'm gonna let Hal 
and Brian talk about this and introduce it, and we'll be back with you in a second. <laughs> so, uh, in all my research, um, I'm just fascinated by Rolly um, because his career was so diverse. He did everything from graphic design to sculpture, uh, and one of the things that, that we found out uh, how he actually managed to make the jump from, from animation into Imagineering was uh, he, he did an art show and that he talked about a little bit uh, with drawings and paintings, uh, but he also made these little propellers, uh, these little kinetic sculptures that would have tiny little propellers on them. And uh, I, there's a story, um, I actually kind of knew about the story, so at the beginning, I'll, uh, I give him something uh, in payment, but he's actually, uh, we'll run that first, and, and then he's actually gonna tell the story about the payment and stuff and, and show you a little bit about uh, the propeller stuff. I wondered if you could show me how to make a propeller. Uh. Because I love these pencils. Okay. And then I read your book and I was like, oh, I have an L and I, I need to pay you because I think that's part of the deal. <laughs> well, we need to do more than that. Um, <laughs> I have a ball I have a pen. Yeah, thank you. What happened was when I, uh, uh, Blaine, uh, I'm trying to think of the animator's name that built the first one. I went into his office and this little propeller was going. And uh, I said, how'd you do that? And he says, it's a secret. And I say, okay. And so um, I'd come back in different times and the little propeller was still going. It was on his lamp. He had one of those lamps there, not realizing it was the heat of the lamp that made it turn. So I, after a while, I mean, I had to be three or four times asking him that. And he finally said, um, okay, well, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll sell it to you. I said, great. I said, how much? He says, a penny. So he sold it to me for a penny. I said, now tell me how to make it. Well, the whole secret was, see, I take this out and I take it and get a uh, nail. And this was a propeller. I'd bend it and I'd make a propeller shape out of it. And then I take a nail and put a dent in there. And it never worked because the nail was sharp and made it sharp in there so it wouldn't ride on a push pin. So then finally he told me, you take this ballpoint pen and you press the ballpoint pen in it. I don't, we can't do it here, but you have to do it on the table. And then it's nice and smooth. So what happens is when it's nice and smooth like that and sits on that, it spins. And so that's how we... This is the greatest moment of my life, after the birth of my children, <laughs> and my wedding. There you go. Look at that. Look oh, at that. So well, there you go, Howard. Wow, that doesn't take much out of anything to make it go. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so, through the generous support of the Blackwing Palomino Pencil Company, all of you right now in your bags have the makings of a Rolly Crump propeller. You have a pencil, a Blackwing pencil, you have a push pin, a pen, and you can now take a moment and make your own propeller, just like Rolly did. So what do we do? Oh, wait a minute, wait, oh, I think, ta oh, okay. Being we're, summoned. We're so being you summoned do your, over. Do your part. Here. Keep propellering, keep propellering, we're gonna. We wanna see those spin. Yeah. See how many we can get going all at once. We're going to set a Guinness World Record, I think. Everybody's <laughs> got to give Rolly Crump a penny, too, if it works. That's right. When after we say how. How do we... Uh... Yeah, we're going to have to put the cameras over there. So. What's that? The camera's there. Oh, the camera's over there. Okay. But he should be able to hear it. Can he hear or see it? He should be able... He will see out there. All right, we have one more special surprise for you. Yeah. 
We're about to cut to a live feed to California to introduce Rolly Crump. Hi, Rolly! If you want to say hi, he's over here. Yep. He's right here on this camera. He's over here on this camera. How you doing, Rolly? How you doing? I'm doing good. We just played all the videos that he made with you. The audience loved it. They just played um, oh. that they made you with the pack. Oh, I okay. You're making your propeller now. She got me. Are you having a good time? Yeah. 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 Just want to say hi to everyone real quick and I'll let you go on with your day. That's it. I'm going to just say hi and goodbye. Hi, good. Yeah, that's right. Hi. Hi. Oh, Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.